Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a special guest, June Hunt. She's the daughter of the legendary American oil tycoon, H.L. Hunt. She's an author, singer, speaker, and founder of Hope for the Heart Ministries, which is a worldwide biblical counseling ministry. She's also the host of Hope in the Night, which is a, a live one-hour call-in counseling program. And she's an accomplished musician. She has toured overseas with the USO and has been a guest soloist for the Billy Graham Crusades. And today I want to get into her incredible story of coming to faith in Christ, but also talk about these ministries that she's involved in. So please welcome June Hunt. Thank you. I'm honored. So I want to get into, we're going to talk about your ministry in a little bit, but before that, I want to get into your, your story. Uh, you grew up in Dallas, Texas, right? Correct. In a very large family. I think there were 15 children in your family, but from various wives. Is that correct? What you're describing is messy. <laughs> what you're <laughs> describing is complex and uh, many times secretive. Um, uh, my I'll say it this way. I, I grew up uh, as June Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, which is a made-up name. Uh, my my mother uh, was one half of my father's age, and so there were four of us, my brother, a year older, and two younger sisters, uh, and we were the Wright family. I just thought it was so ironic because... The word right sounds like the converse would be wrong. But um, in fact, what was going on was wrong. And so I just thought, I don't know why the word right was used, but uh, that just like a play on words. And I don't think people were trying to be clever. I just think it's just what it was. My point is, yes, my dad had uh, six, six children from a first marriage and <clears throat> And then later, when uh, uh, my parents uh, married, I remember we moved into his house when I was 12. And eight, 11 months later, uh, my parents married. And uh, it, it was, um, I, I thought it was all secretive. and But uh, then I found out it was front page Dallas Morning News, which did not help because I was shocked and I didn't mm. know what to say to other students when they were saying, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us your mother's getting married or that your mom has? Anyway, so I remember thinking, why would I tell you? Because I was silent. I didn't talk much at all uh, because people wouldn't be able to relate to my situation. I knew nobody in my situation um, I later learned, uh, Beckett, that, well, there was a man I'd seen a number of times at our house. I guess I was upper uh, high school, could could have been in, in uh, college. And he said, now, you know, you're my half sister, don't you? And I looked at him. I said, no, I wasn't aware. He mm -hmm. said, yes, there are four of us in Atlanta. I said, oh, uh, thank you for telling me what do you say? Uh, so the, my dad had three families concurrently at the same time going on. And um, in a dysfunctional family, and I think you might understand this, in a dysfunctional family, you don't function normally, like with communicating well, and then conflict resolution. I never saw conflict resolution uh, my dad was basically a dictator. Everything was only his way, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very hard because um, sometimes there was not a negative going on, and other times there were negatives. And uh, so I I uh, was silent because I didn't know how to process pain and process uh, life Uh uh, Beckett, sometimes my dad would say to me, your mother is mentally ill today. and Or he would say this to her and he would take her to psychiatrists. No one ever agreed with him. But my greatest fear growing up very candidly was I was afraid 
the dad would institutionalize my mother. Mm -hmm. He would find a psychiatrist whom he, a corrupt, uh, he would identify a corrupt psychiatrist who he could buy off and then mom would be uh, gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't an idle threat when he would say this because his eldest son from a first marriage was institutionalized as paranoid schizophrenic. In fact, he had a frontal lobotomy. Wow. Doctor approved. And so when these threats would come, if dad was upset, like um, one time he saw me with tears. I remember uh, it was the second time he'd seen me with tears and it's tears are a sign of mental illness you are mentally ill. And so uh, because of his uh, the son, it, that's why I'm saying it wasn't an idle threat. I'm just saying it was, it was bizarre. It was different. Uh, nobody had what I had going on, at least growing up, that I'm aware of. And so all the more um, do I understand pain. And yet I do believe we can have pain with a purpose and Mm -hmm. we have to see what could be useful in the lives of others if we are wise. And so were, were you, when you were growing up, were you introduced to Christianity? Were you raised kind of in a Christian church? Like, or did you have contact with any kind of Christians? Well, I went to what would be classified as a Christian church. My dad said, Christianity's a crutch. Mm -hmm. And the one time I confronted him about his other women, uh, I said, how how can you have other women and mother is totally loyal to you and uh, has always been, and she truly, she never spoke negatively about him she even when he would be cruel and i couldn't believe her i I couldn't understand her response um and so i i said how how can you do this and he said i'm not a christian i don't have to go by christian ethics Mm. and in a way beckett that was um insightful meaning I was expecting him to act with Christian principles. By the way, I didn't know. I wasn't a Christian at the time myself, but I didn't know it uh, because um, I thought that if you go to a something classified as a Christian church, that you're a Christian. What that meant to me, being a Christian, meant I wasn't Jewish. That's, that's all I thought. Mm-hmm. I then later saw to my shock a number of students, high school students, they could literally pick up a Bible. Let's say they heard uh, a teacher or the pastor mention a scripture. Um, Let's say it's John 3, 16. And they would go, and they're there. And I think, how do you do that? The, or, wait, this is at Hockaday? The Hockaday uh, girls could do that? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. I was at a girls' school, <clears throat> uh, which is kind of a le- elite um, preparatory for, for yeah. college. But um, it was not there. I, uh, we Actually, what happened was we were in this mainline denomination, and someone handed my father a piece of paper and by the way dad had not gone to church for 40 years except for weddings and funerals Mm -hmm. so now mom is on the scene and she had only one non-negotiable and that is that we would be in church now she was raised in a particular denomination that would be called mainstream but it just so happened that I, I mean, we went um, most Sundays 
the only scripture I ever heard was the Lord's Prayer, part of a ritual right. of the church service. Uh, mother did want us to go to Sunday school, but there was no, there was no studying of the Bible because I, I, I had a Bible on a shelf that mother had given me a white Bible. It had never been opened. Uh, all the pages were still stuck together. Um, and uh, meaning the, the, it could be, it could be gold or, or silver that right. you know, the edges and um, so, so uh, somebody had da handed my dad a piece of paper that ranked all the denominations for their written materials. In other words, what would be that which would come from the denomination itself? And it was based on being pink or red. The ranking was, in other words, communistic. Or socialistic or Marxist. oh i see so yeah. he was he was an anti-communist like he was very anti-communist see he saw because of his age he saw one country after another taken over by the communist regime mm -hmm. uh, and uh so he was for freedom and he was a a patriot of this nature of addressing things <clears throat> that he believed um, were wrong. And there were things that were wrong. But I just can tell you, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for many things I learned. I'm also, uh, I was uh, very disheartened and hurt by his actions that were not in any way uh, uh, in, in, in line with authentic Christianity mm -hmm. because of his lifestyle, these women and uh, treatment of my mom. I was very concerned about her. I've tried to protect her. I, without saying it, I, I tried to be her protector, mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, kids think that they, and, and they can do their best, but you can't fully protect a, a mother or need be a father, whatever, but uh, we, we don't have that power. Right. When we are young, when, uh, but at least we do try. At least I did. And I think my, I know my brother did too. So my point is it was just complex. Um, and I had to learn the hard way. Oh, um, I, I, I was just learning by exposure, seeing there are there are people, youth leaders that were extraordinary at a different church, mm -hmm. not at all. And 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 I didn't want to go to this. Um, I didn't want to be in this other church because I said, "Mom, I I don't want to do that." And she said, "Oh, honey, can't we just have harmony in the home?" can't we just have harm? And I would do anything for her. I said, okay. So I knew we were changing churches, but I was, I could not tell you how impressed uh, I was at this other church. And it was biblically based. Uh, the music was gorgeous and it was personal, uh, like mm -hmm. songs that would deal with having a relationship with Christ and, you know, oh, I never shall forget the day when Jesus took my sin away and made my life anew. You know, words that I didn't understand even. I, I don't know these, I, these messages through song. Um, but it was, the, it, it was the testimony of the youth and the youth leaders that were just uh, powerful. And um, but what what made your mother want to change churches? She to this didn't. Church? No, oh. she, not that she did. My dad was handed this piece of paper for the ranking and the number one of the more. The red church. Um, um, yeah, the red, the red. <laughs> uh, that ours was in the number one category. Oh, okay. so the so the mainline church you were going to was in the red category. 
Yes. Yeah. And so you were kind of, you had to switch churches. Well, he said, he looked at the bottom, which was Roman Catholicism and Roman Catholicism. And then he said, no. And then went to the next one, but right above. And next thing I know, I'm being told, you know, and I, so I would try to help prepare my sisters for if there were changes. And so um, we, we all uh, now for the first time were in a biblically based church and I'd never seen anything like it. I'd, ne I'd never heard a Bible study. I'd never heard the Bible taught in power. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so it was fascinating. In fact, uh, I'll just tell you something that was the truth. I went my first Sunday I was, it was, it was, it was the second Sunday we were at that church, but now I'm in this, I, I'm invited to come to a Sunday school class and they were doing something called high school Bible. You could get one hour credit of old Testament, one hour credit of new Testament for the whole year. And um, of course, and then they, that Sunday, they passed out a test and I thought, hmm. and I looked at the questions and I just motioned to the teacher that I just kind of went, in essence, I don't think I can answer any of these. She said, that's okay. That's all right. You, you just see if there's anyone that you think you might know. But it, whatever it is, it's okay. So <laughs> I'm reading, oh, God, please help me answer something. And I thought, wait a minute. I think I've heard this one. But, I, you know, it's like, what are the four Gospels? And I'm going, da, 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 da. Uh, and so I did, that was the only one I would have any answer for. So I wrote, there were four blanks, Matthew, Martin, Luther King. <laughs> That's how I ended That's it. Amazing. And I didn't know I was wrong either. So, <laughs> but I remember it because then later when I found out, oh, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's amazing. So um, that just shows you my ignorance um but i can tell you the influence of the testimonies of people who had authentic christianity not just a lot a lot of people have cultural christianity meaning they kind of want to go by the four spiritual i'm sorry go by the uh ten commandments they want to uh live their lives uh in a fairly moral way Right. And that doesn't mean that there's ever been a time when they've humbled their hearts and received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, giving mm. him control of our lives. I'd never even heard of anything like that. So it took me a while, but I watched silently. I didn't ask questions. I just watched. And people would tell about when they had humbled their hearts and at different ages and and you know but i would see all these adults going down walking down an aisle at my church it was a huge church um and uh, the youth program was extraordinary um again i was silent though and i just would kind of smile and and but you know the kids were great they would sit by me let's say here's this i'm i'm, I'm a, a, a junior in high school and i couldn't turn in my bible because i had no idea of where any of the books were or what, mm -hmm. what the order was and, and so they would sit by me no one made fun of me and they would they would just lean over and or, or take my Bible and they'd quickly turn where I was supposed to be. I was so grateful. I um, mean, I, I was so ignorant too, but uh, they saw that I was not wise. I did not have authentic Christianity. And finally, I'll just say this. I was told that there was this youth camp. Oh, you'll love youth camp. Oh, and so I was, I thought, well, what do you do? So I bought some itching powder thinking maybe people play tricks on each other I would go. <laughs> and th that wasn't exactly how it was mm -hmm. it was a whole so a solid week but um the first uh, uh day i remember 
there was a Bible study that, and this is at a campground, and it was wonderful uh, uh, atmosphere. And then, and then they had missionaries. What? Well, I didn't know what a missionary looked like. I thought they had women with buns on their <laughs> their heads or something. I do, but these looked like normal people. And I, you know, and I would hear about mission work. I thought well, that's interesting. Um, and um, on the fourth day, I did go to the person who was actually my teacher in the in the church, the, this extraordinary communicator of truth. And I went to her. I said, "How do I know if I'm a Christian?" I think I am. Mm. She said, June, I can't know your heart like God knows your heart. But if you weren't a Christian, would you be willing to do whatever God would want you to do? Now I'm silent. I'm thinking, what, what could God want me to do? I don't. And I, and I thought, and, and what if it doesn't work? Because I'd seen all oh, I mean, now we've talked about months and months. I'm seeing people walk down an aisle and they would say they're giving their lives to the Lord. Well, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and so finally, you know, here I am being asked a question and I thought, but what if that doesn't work? I thought, well, I guess if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But what if it would have worked? See, I'm I'm math. Math makes sense. Mm -hmm. Have a math mind. Uh, equations. You have if you know the equation, then you come up with the right answer in math. Now that makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense to those who don't like math. Yeah. But, but uh, I I thought, well, what if it would have worked, and yet I refused to even try to ask Jesus to come into my life to give control of my life to him um I thought I don't want to be cocky I'm not cocky so I don't want to be prideful because if it would have worked I want what those students have mm -hmm. they have this peace that passes all understanding they have uh, joy there were there were qualities I had not seen consist. I mean, it was so many of them. Not just it wouldn't be every one of them, but I can just tell you I had not seen. And they weren't weird, by the way. <laughs> I want to emphasize that. <laughs> they, they weren't weird. They, in fact, they were many of them were major leaders of their their high schools. And so the more I saw the more I was drawn. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll try. Now, you know, Beckett, there's a scripture about if you have faith as big as a grain of a mustard seed. I yeah. did not have faith even as big as a mustard seed, maybe an 18th of a mustard <laughs> seed. But I thought, I will try. It'll either work or it won't. But I was sincere. And I did pray to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Basically, a prayer that was, Lord, I, I realize I have chosen wrong many times. Um, I ask you to forgive me for my sin. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior, to take control of my life. Hmm. And basically, I'm just doing what I think you're wanting me to do. You know, in your holy name, I pray. Amen. And I had no idea what would happen. I wondered, would there be a burning bush anywhere? <laughs> would there be some <laughs> handwriting in the sky or something? There was not, nothing like that. But I will tell you, I began to learn. I was absorbing and I did, I, and I never questioned this from that point on, never once had a moment of doubt. I knew I had a changed life, but it took me, um, there, there was a major area where it made no sense to me. How could forgiveness be right? 
So there were areas where I was um, stuck because I thought it can't be right to forgive. That's just letting somebody off the hook. Mm. I can't, I can't, I mean, because <clears throat> I'm now learning the story about Adam and Eve and he tells them one thing to not do, only one thing. And then that they do what he tells them not to do. And, but he had told them in the day, if you eat of this tree, um, there will be a consequence. Mm -hmm. And so they were evicted from uh, the garden. So I couldn't see why, what's this issue of forgiveness? And I did have a bitterness and an unforgiving heart toward my dad, but the pain that he continued to cause uh, my mom and <clears throat> just how he treated people. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have victory in that area and or understanding comprehension until I was in my young 20s. And so when you, so after that, when you, you know, prayed that prayer and your life changed, did you, uh, did you talk to your mom about it? Did you talk to your siblings? Like what was the reaction from your family? I don't think I told anyone for, I don't think I had a conversation. Don't forget, I wasn't verbal. And, and yet I, it is true with that one teacher. I mean, I know it was, I had to make a decision. And to not decide is a decision of no at that time. And that, but that wasn't it. I, I, I was so convinced that all these that I could genuinely respect, uh, they had that, that quality of life that I wanted. Um, so no, I didn't, I, I didn't end up telling anyone verbally. Um, so uh, but I knew the truth that I now had, you know, that word faith. Um, I took God at his word. Mm -hmm. It's faith, you know, there's faith, hope, and love. The word hope is looking at what God says and it's what if there are promises, uh, this is assured hope, guaranteed mm -hmm. hope that whatever God, it's not just, it's not just wishful thinking. It's actually true hope. It's real. If, if it's something that he has promised. Right. And, um, or in the person of Jesus Christ, what, what God, what Jesus has said, we have this hope and anchor for the soul firm and secure notice firm and secure. Well, it's actually that hope. The word hope in Hebrews is talking about Jesus himself. He's our anchor. He anchors our lives. And I did experience that. What's the difference between faith and hope? Most people don't know. Um, but what I learned was hope is the assured promise of whatever God has said. Uh, faith is acting on that promise. There's a time when Peter, he wasn't sure what he was seeing out on the water. Uh, he was in a boat. Uh, he sees, finally, he sees it is not a ghost, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And basically, come, come to me. Uh, he wants, he, you know, you tell me to come to you. Well, he's over now. Jesus says, come walk on the water now that is beyond the normal that is not natural yeah but if jesus said come and sure enough faith is taking that step out of the boat walking you know toward christ and sure enough he does this but then all of a sudden he mentally is thinking this is not possible this is not natural this is how can this be? And then his doubt causes him to start sinking. He right. He's walking on the water. And then right. Jesus takes him by the hand, pulls him uh, out of a, a very negative, treacherous uh, situation. But the point is, um, sometimes we can question, well, surely that can't work. And I understand. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very 
cognitive, very logical. And it makes sense that at times we need to know what does God say for sure. I mean, it's written, that's written in his word. And then literally take a step of faith out of the boat, go and do what he asks us to do if he's calling us to do something. And then we do that. And sure enough, he meets um, the uh, need that we have in our lives and he is uh, the author of our future. Yeah, praise God. And so when you went off to college, were you, were you, uh, you know, kind of a, a vocal Christian in college or were you, was it still kind of private for you? I, I was verbal uh, for the situations I had. I wanted to be at a Christian school, but um uh, I, my dad somehow, he just, he was a dictator as to where we all four had to go. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't known to be an evangelical uh, college. Right. And so I, I did that, but um, I, I, I was one of the few people that even went to Bible class on Sunday mornings and church. <clears throat> I just, it was pretty dark <laughs> on, on the dorm floor. And yet then sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, could I get a ride with you? And so, you know, I, it didn't matter. I was hungry. I, it was more that I was hungry to grow yeah. because I knew I still had so much to learn. Uh, later, <clears throat> when I graduated from uh, college, uh, my uh, the, the pastor of my church said, you are going to be our junior high director because I had started teaching a class of um, girls, uh, I guess when I was a sophomore. And that was the first time I ever was studying to communicate what the Bible said. And so my first job out of, uh, out of college was for uh, the uh, division of junior high at 600 in that division and uh, had 120 leaders. And my leaders taught me how to lead because I really didn't know that I was a product of a changed life through Christ through the youth program, but it, and it was extraordinary. So I started a what Sadie Hawkins singers wash tub band and had, we, it was hilarious. We would um, teach them play guitar and do these funny, funny songs. And I would pick um, five, I picked five seventh graders, eighth graders, ninth graders. So for those 15, uh, we were playing uh, washboards and wash tubs and guitars and orange juice cans with beans in them. And so we would do, uh, (laughs) does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? And we would do these funny songs and they had their outfits that we parents made just cute as could be denim gringham check and all and we all of a sudden had all these requests to go all over the city and there would be two songs that they would always do uh that were spiritual songs and two of the girls would give a testimony of what it meant to be a true authentic christian and so that was part of this novelty group but it was um not just for sheer fun, it was their opportunity to present to others, to schoolmates, to all these different kinds of unusual venues. And so uh, I, I loved, I wanted the kids to be active. There, there were times I would look and I'd think, hmm, I, this guy's on the roll, but I, I've not seen him. And so I would call, say hi. This is June Hunt, and I'm the uh, junior high director. Is it possible that you would want to help us and be a part of what we're doing? Um, they, I listened to the response, and well, you know, is it possible you would uh, uh, be interested in doing posters uh, about the activities? And one guy said, "Oh, okay." He had not been coming, so now he comes. By the way, he ended up being at the Air Force Academy. Sharp guy. But he just needed to be asked. And mm. so we would have multiple people 
m m multiple youth that would pray to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they would get directed for their lives because I knew what it was like for me. I had no direction. When I was in junior high at all, uh, it was only in high school that I even began to hear the truth about what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to not only let us know that he has a plan and a purpose, but he has the power to fulfill that plan. One of my favorite scriptures, Beckett, is where God says, this is Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I love like, that verse. I, I shared that with a 13-year-old boy um, about six months ago, five months ago. And I said, called him by name. I'll, I'm going to call him um, Lincoln. Uh, I said, Lincoln, see, he had written a suicide note mm. to his parents. And then he wrote another suicide note to his uh, siblings. And the mom was scared for his life. And he's a redhead. Uh, he was short. And he was being bullied. And uh, I said, Lincoln, I want you to listen very carefully. When I was 16, I was now having a driver's license. And I was the lead car at Mockingbird Lane and Central Expressway, the lead car. And I thought, there's so much pain in our family. I hate the pain. Dad will never change. Life will never change. The family will never change. Press the pedal, press the pedal, press the pedal, press. The, I just kept saying it over and over. It like almost a mantra. And I thought if I can just, I'll just veer to the left, go over the overpass and crash at the bottom and the pain will end. Wow. I said, Lincoln, I thought I can do this. And then my math brain kicked in. What if I don't die? <laughs> what if I'm maimed? Yeah. Permanently maimed. I can't do that to my mom. I can't. I can't. So then the light turns and we go on. I drive on. I said, Lincoln, when I said things will never change, I was sincere, but I was sincerely wrong too. Mm. That is not true. I don't want you thinking whatever is painful in your life, what, however you've been treated, whatever is going on that hurts your heart. I don't want you thinking like I did. Things will never change. The truth is life is a series of changes. Life is a series of changes and choices. So you have the opportunity to watch the changes that you're going to see in your life. Do not think that life will never change. That is false. Mm -hmm. You've got to go with the truth because Jesus, sorry, because uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, and I said, I want you to write this down. And I, we got it written down. And then in the morning, I want you to first thing in the morning, say, thank you, God, that you say, you know, the plans you have for me, plans to prosper me, not to harm me, plans to give me hope and a future. And you'll do that sometime during the day, whenever. And before you go to bed at night, again, Jeremiah 29, 11. Thank you, God, that you say, you know the plans you have for me, plans to prosper me, not to harm me, plans to give me hope and a future. 
I said, will you do that, Lincoln? And he said, yes. Well, I can tell you, um, uh, to his surprise, and he was really struggling. They had him in counseling. They were trying to do anything to be a, figure out what to help this young man, 13 years old, who had already given up on life. And he uh, goes to school the first day. But somehow, it wasn't the same school. He didn't change. The parents didn't change the school. Now he's in a new school. He's on the football team. And the mom is telling me he's on the football team. I said, he, and he, he loves school now. And I said, what? I said, uh, okay, he must be fast. And she said, he's very fast. <laughs> because of his height, right. I knew it wouldn't he wouldn't <clears throat> compete with those who are really tall because I, when I was a youth director, I remember tall. I, I couldn't believe the number of boys that were over six feet tall. I remember them thinking I didn't know junior high could get this tall. And yes, they can. But but that wasn't him. But he was fast and he is thriving. And Amazing. instead of just surviving Beckett, he is thriving. And he did take hold of that promise that that God had for him. And I think anyone, everyone needs to know that scripture because you never know when somebody has given up hope. And yet our God of hope, the one, the, the God of the Bible offers us an opportunity to be in his will and then we can't be any more fulfilled in life than to be in his will praise god now how did you end up starting hope for the heart how did that come about well i kind of was surprised um after i was a junior high director and then later a college and career director again i didn't plan any of this i became a conference speaker and then someone um, contacted me uh, from another state and said, June, I think you need to be on radio. I said, well, I don't feel any call to be on radio. And they said, well, what if instead you can say something at this location, here's a location, and yet if people could hear the same message in multiple locations, wouldn't that maximize your life more. And I hadn't mm -hmm. thought of that. Um, somebody had wanted me the month before to do be on television. I just said, I don't feel there's a need and I don't feel called, but I went to back to those men who wanted me to be on television. And, and I said, do you think there's a need here? And they said, absolutely. And they told me the hole in, uh, as in a, a, a big hole in, um, in Christian radio, and uh, there, was hard, there was only one person, a female, who was even doing radio. And I did not hear that person. I just heard about it. I heard she did recipes on occasion. And so I said, well, I will not do recipes. Instead, <laughs> I do burnt offerings. And, uh, and I won't do a woman's program. But I would do, I would do a program that deals with current issues of the life and of the heart and uh, where people are struggling where they because I knew what it was like to struggle back and mm -hmm. I knew what it's like to think things will never change I, I I was I grew up in an adulterous home and so I had experienced so many things that and I had even said but just before I became a Christian I thought if God is supposed to be a loving God, why would he allow one person, my dad, to cause so much pain? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have an answer. But I know that you will know this one scripture. It was huge to me. It's in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is the book on wisdom. Mm -hmm. And it stated that way. I mean, that the, the wise person, all these marvelous scriptures to let us know 
how to be wise and or how to be foolish. But mm -hmm. the point is, um, Proverbs 3, the third chapter, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, that wasn't my favorite part. This was my favorite part. Lean not on your own understanding. You mean I don't have to understand? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I don't understand why a loving God would permit all this. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Mm -hmm. He'll make your path straight. My favorite part wasn't all the other. It was just lean not on your own understanding. I don't have to understand it. I, I've got to be willing to go on and entrust my life to the Lord. And what I learned was indeed, um, yes, there will be people like me who would have significant pain and maybe make all kinds of wrong choices. I certainly made my wrong choices, but what's important is the pain we have now, it's with a purpose. Because now we will be able to relate to others like I did with Lincoln mm -hmm. about giving up on life, uh, not seeing any any way life will change. Now, if I hadn't experienced that, I wouldn't be able to talk to Lincoln, a young man who wanted to make a difference in his life. I said, what, what would you like to do in your life, uh, Lincoln? And he said, well, I'm a drummer. And so before he left one day, he had done this picture of drums with Lincoln on the drums. And then I'm, I think he had me playing guitar, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I'm just sitting here thinking how wonderful if he could just believe that there's life beyond the immediate. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is, and God promises uh, so many specific things that we can watch him fulfill we don't fulfill it in fact that's the amazing part if we yield our will to his will uh the babe in fact this i never forget up here i'm reading the bible never read it before and here's faithful is the one who calls you and he will do it uh, what i'm gonna read that again faithful is the one who calls you and he will do it I thought I'm the one who had to do all the figuring out how to change. No, it's, this is First Thessalonians 5.11. Faithful is the one who calls you, and that is God. And whatever he's called you to do, he will empower you to do it. It's not us trying to figure out, well, how do I change? How do He'll, he'll have the way to do it, and he'll identify for each of us individually when the time is right. Okay, now's the time to address this. Now's the time to change here. So what I learned along the way is, um, and I don't feel I, I, I don't feel I've been in charge of the trajectory of my life, and I mean that. I think God just keep, kept opening doors. I did a USO tour to Vietnam, singing, you know, uh, I uh, sang for the uh, Billy Graham Crusades several times, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't open those doors or to um, um, be on the Today Show and all just different things. But somehow, all of a sudden, I'm being asked to do radio, and so we did. In fact, the, the third year, I did a course. I called it, it uh, Counseling Through the Bible, a three-year course. What does the Bible actually say about anger? Here you have all the A's. We had basically a hundred topics. Mm -hmm. And it was definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions on a hundred different topics. And um, people, I didn't know who would come, uh, meaning I was writing the material. And the reason this is important, there was no material. How could this be? There was no Christian book on childhood sexual abuse. 
I hear I have been a youth director. I know the statistics, one in three girls, one in five boys up to the age of 18 are victims of childhood sexual abuse. How can there not be a Christian book? Mm. Why is there so little on this topic at all? So that's what we did. We were writing materials. Um, I, I had a friend. We, we, I, we looked in, with scripture all the way through for definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions. Um, I remember one time having a man, no, a man, not having man, a, a, a man who was a um, general manager of a radio station. He said, June, um, I just want to emphasize we're a Christian radio station. Uh, we don't do programs on sexual addiction. I said, oh, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but there's an epidemic. And at that time, it was known to be an epidemic of what was going on, but it was impacting. There, there were many who called themselves Christians who had a sexual addiction. I said, we're just being relevant to our culture. That's all. And uh, I didn't know. They, I said, I, I have to do topics. Now, you can choose to do something else while at Siri, let be like a series of a week, like Monday on definitions, Tuesdays on um, characteristics, Wednesday causes, and then Thursday and Friday on solutions. But I just felt we needed to be purposeful about content that people struggle with. So it would be anger, fear, depression, uh, the motions. It could be um, abuse areas, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence. Um, I knew about that because in our home there was mm -hmm. domestic violence. Uh, and yet where was the Christian material on that? Yeah. And so th we were coming in and the different kind of way and, and then later I attend uh, nine years later I was asked to do a radio program called which we called uh, hope in the night and um, th then I started taking calls so we were doing the two programs but the but specifically the call-in program which I'll be doing tonight from 11 p.m to midnight and there's is no that and that's that's Dallas time central standard central time, time yes even okay. though we had people who call from California to um, New Jersey, I think it was last night. So. Amazing. So you're still doing hope, hope in the night. Yes. You're still doing that. And so how do you, I mean, this is because this is, you know, obviously this is kind of the, the culture, what's happening in the culture today. So dominantly, how do you counsel people on if they call in and they they're struggling with, LGBT kind of Q, all those issues, like the, those kind of sexual issues. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in the late, um, well, this this year, my pastor said, "June, um, Dr. Robert Jeffers asked, would you do a series on the hot topics? We have something called uh, my church called Discipleship University, and there are many courses that are." The person could attend. Um, so I began with abortion because of the pandemic and the uptick in bullying. There's something, by the way, uh, Beckett, there's a new term called uh, a new word in the English language. It's called bully side, people who commit suicide because of being bullied. Wow. So um, I did bullying, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence. And then homosexuality was one. We have excellent material on homosexuality. I've taught many, many times at certain conferences. Those uh, for those exiting out of homosexuality, or those interested, and um, I think it's important to realize. Um, if, for example, if I have a caller, and I'm always honored i feel honored 
they would call. Uh, those mm -hmm. who are in, uh, I'll call it the gay lifestyle, or LGBT, uh, but, and the other letters. Um, if someone says, you know, I was born this way, I said, I know that that is what is typically told, but I want you to think about it this way. Because of very specific communication from God through the word of God, the Bible, where there is explicit language of do not do this, and mm -hmm. there are different wordings you see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The God of the Bible would never create someone. This, it just doesn't make sense. He would never create someone to be what he forbids. Right. That would be cruel. That would right. be absolutely cruel. Now, I understand those who have been told this. And yet, I'll typically ask, Talk to me about, and typically I don't even go there first. I'm, I, I just say before, before whatever their question is, I just say, but before we go there, would you just talk with me about what it was like for you growing up? What was your relationship, for example? I, I would say, Beckett, what, what would be the relationship that you had with your father? Mm -hmm. By the way, would you share that with me now is that appropriate that would be like right now I'm right yeah I'm yeah busy. well oh uh, yeah I mean the it's interesting because I was the youngest of eight kids right so and my father was a, a lawyer in Dallas and he was very busy so by the time it got to me I mean there wasn't really there wasn't a relationship um <clears throat> my mother obviously my my of course i was very close with my mother she doted on me um we were very close but when my when it came to my father he was always you know a good father and kind of um very a good kind of disciplinarian and, and he kept things in order he was very orderly and kept my family in order because it was a you know, big family and but I never felt affirmed by him. I never felt uh, at a young at a young age. I never felt like this kind of. I never felt like I could go to him and just have a conversation. It was always just like, "Hi, Dad." You know, it was very, very short conversations my entire life. That's exactly what I wanted to know, and I'll tell you why I asked that question. Because instead of getting into whatever the question is that I'm being asked, I'll, I'll say first, tell me about your your family. And I, I'm looking for, if it's a man that I'm talking with, I want to know about his relationship with his father. Mm -hmm. If it's a female, I'll say, what was your relationship like with your mother? There are three classic reasons why people are drawn into a homosexual lifestyle. First, an absent or distant same-sex parent. Number mm -hmm. two, and that fits what you just said, the absent or he wasn't absent, he was distant. Right. Number two, a harsh critical why aren't you like your brother why aren't you and it's comparing and mm -hmm. or or you, you're not you're not meeting my expectation of what uh you should it, and so it's a harsh critical uh same-sex parent or third childhood sexual abuse which was another thing that happened to me as well okay and with every almost every single person that I have talked to and I've talked with thousands over the years and care, I care. There is 
typically I'll say, how old were you when you had your first sexual touch when someone touched you mm -hmm. sexually? Was it a male or a female? And we're talking typically for guys, it's the male, it's a male. And um, so what you have is here, if dad is not, for whatever reason, I mean, many times they're not aware mm -hmm. that dad is not even, they're not trying to be uh, off base, but the, there's a hole. And if there is someone there to be the surrogate father, not necessarily a father, but just someone who would care, that person um, meets a need that hasn't been met mm -hmm. in that boy's life. And what you see is it can be, typically it is two of the three causes for homosexuality. So you asked me, how would I handle this? I, again, I want to know what, what, there's, what was their background. So is, it wouldn't be God made me this way. Because again, if you're logical about who the God of the Bible is, um, God would never make a person be what he forbids. And then therefore, then why? Why? Because people right. do sincerely, they're very confused. They want answers. So we help them with the material we have to get understanding. And then what are choices? What are the choices? What what do I need to know now? And so our material, again, deals with definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions to help those who say, well, I do want to live life God's way. I'm willing to entrust my life to him. And then we can explain how he meets the three inner needs we all have for love, significance, and security. Instead of looking to a person to meet those needs, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. That's Jeremiah 31, 3. He, you, and for significance, you're so significant that he knew, knows the plans he has for you. He's already got plans for you. And, and the plans are good for the future. And in regard to the need for security, love, significant security, the security, uh, my favorite scripture, by the way, is Deuteronomy 31.3. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy uh, 31.8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. See, the Bible says, my God will meet all your needs. And sometimes we're looking to people to meet our needs. But as you know, people fail people. And so we can be painfully upended, uh, painfully wounded and hurt if we keep looking for a person to meet all our needs. Mm -hmm. Instead, Philippians 4.19 says, my God will meet all your needs. And I know that firsthand. Um, I used to be very insecure and I didn't tell, talk about it, didn't say anything about it, but I knew I was insecure because of my family background. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so then when I found the scripture and I tell people this, Instead of just reading the scripture, Deuteronomy 31, 8, personalize it. The Lord himself goes before me and will be with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I will not be afraid. I will not be discouraged. And I tell them to read it for 31 days, or I'll say read it for three months if that's the need, if, you know, several times times a day and let his truth set us free amen i love that you i mean you do really have a math brain because you're so i love how like logical you are about these things and it's it's so helpful so tell people how they can get they can find hope for the heart what what's the website for hope for the heart 
It's hopefortheheart.org. That's all, hopefortheheart.org. And then, if so, Hope in the Night, again, it's at 11. What time is it again? It is 11 p.m. Central Time to Midnight. I love that you're... You're a night owl. I oh, love absolutely. that you just, you're amazing. You're a trooper. I, I love it that time. Yep. That's, and that's when people often let down their guard. Yeah. That's when they're vulnerable. Yeah. You know? and, and and just even not knowing how do I navigate this or I don't know what to do. And sometimes there is an issue of suicide. Sometimes, you know, there are those who have committed suicide. Now, what do they do? Or, or usually it's a lot about uh, personal interactions that haven't gone well, or they will have anger and they don't know what to do with their anger. Just, it can be a plethora of, of true, genuine problems. They want to know, what do I do? Uh, and what I'm very clear about is um, we have the privilege of presenting God's truth for today's problems. And we do it with biblical hope and practical help. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for being on the show. I love, uh, I, I love what you're doing and all that you're doing for the kingdom. And uh, thank you for being on the show. My joy, my privilege. Thank you. We'll look forward to being together one day. Yes. And guys, thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.